So thanks, Meg and uh, Jen, um, and for everyone else. Uh, my name is Sam Samino, and uh, welcome to the monitoringresources.org training for new and returning users. I work for the USGS and PNAMP, which is the Pacific Northwest Aquatic Monitoring Partnership. And I am the project lead on monitoringresources.org. All right, we're going to go to slide two. MR, uh, or Monitoring Resources, is a, suite of, is a suite of tools and resources that supports coordination of monitoring efforts. Cost, and it's cost effective and uh, helps with uh, some efficient planning. But essentially, it's a tool to document metadata and discover monitoring events. Next slide. So why do we document metadata? Um, there's multiple reasons. For one, resource managers use metadata documentation for funding decisions. So if you've ever been in front of the ISRP board, uh, they might ask you know, for specific uh, metadata information that goes along with your data collection events and data analysis. Researchers use it to help aggregate data and collaborate with others. You can use uh, metadata to kind of fill in some gaps. And then along with data repositories, documenting metadata improves the data access and discovery. And then uh, if you're trying to put together regional reports, say in the Columbia River Basin, documenting metadata will help you connect with other researchers and managers so that you can get an idea of the entire watershed instead of just the piece that you've been studying. Next slide. So what tools can you use? Well, monitoringresources.org provides all the benefits from documenting your metadata in an organized framework, and it also helps you design your project and collaborate with other projects. Next slide. And the aim behind all of this, documenting your data and your metadata in general, is to make data fair, which is findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And I'm sure you've all seen this before, but monitoring resources is one of the tools you can use to help achieve these fair principles. Next slide. So along with documenting metadata and monitoring resources to meet the FAIR principles, we are working on connecting to other programs to help secure investments and reduce redundancies. So ideally, information can be exchanged between all of these entities so that you only need to document certain information once and not in multiple places. Now, unfortunately, these tools or these uh, entities were all created individual of each other. So we're still working on making some of these connections, but we are working on them and that's the important part. And today I'm gonna get into how some of these connections uh, talk to each other and things like that. Um, so next slide. So yeah, this, this figure shows that many of the connections are already taking place. And today we're primarily going to focus on the connection between cbfish.org and monitoringresources.org. Next slide. So most of you are here because you have a contract with the BPA that includes work elements 157 and 162 uh, or both and are required to document your metadata in monitoring resources because of your BPA contract. Next slide. So as I mentioned just a, a minute ago, there's already a connection and communication between CB Fish and monitoring resources. So instead of documenting your metadata in CB Fish and monitoring resources, you only need to document it once in monitoring resources. And so in that top left yellow area, the connection point between monitoring resources and CB Fish at the, happens at the study plan level, 
which means if you have a work element with data collection, which is a work element 157, you'll need to create a monitoring resources study plan, which includes a protocol with data collection methods and a sample design with sampling locations. Now, if you have a, just a work element 162, which is a data analysis work element, you'll need to document a protocol um, with data analysis methods, and you'll need to document a sample design that has an area of inference. So it doesn't necessarily have to have sampling locations, just an area of inference. And then for most people, you have both a work element 157 and a work element 162, which will require a study plan with a protocol containing both data collection and data analysis methods, and a sample design with both sample locations and an area of inference. So this is kind of where people get tripped up a little bit. A lot of people have both. They'll document both data analysis and data collection methods, and they'll, de they'll document their sampling locations, but what they forget is documenting their area of inference which is a requirement for a 162. So uh, just keep that in mind and I'll show you how to do that in just a second. Uh, next slide. So what exactly will you be documenting and monitoring resources uh, today or when you start documenting your, your information? If you could click, Jen. Documentation of metadata using the BPA workflow, which I'll go over today, will allow you to document all the required fields in a BPA contract in one user-friendly workflow. So typically, you'll have one or two study plans linked to one protocol. And the protocol will be made up of multiple methods, which are mapped to metrics. And then you'll also have one or many sample designs that depict where and when your sampling takes place. And so then I'm going to go through all of that today. Uh, next slide. So there are, there are a lot of pieces and parts here. But the BPA workflow organizes the documentation process and simplifies the effort. So instead of doing all these pieces individually, you're kind of doing it in one continuous motion. Next slide. OK, so now we are going to go to monitoringresources.org, and I'll walk through actually documenting content in monitoring resources. OK, perfect. First thing I'll point out here is this is the monitoring resources homepage. Um, essentially, this is what you'll do when you log into monitoring resources. You'll see welcome and your name. And so if you aren't logged in, it'll just it'll give you options to log in. But no, if you're logged in, you'll have your name up here. And when when you click on your name, this is one little quick easy way to get help while you're doing while you're working on monitoring resources. And let me know if you want me to make my screen a little bit bigger. But when you click on your name, you can see your profile, you can see your colleagues, and you can see any collaborators you have. And this is useful because you can add a colleague by clicking on that Add Colleague button. And because I am not logged in, I need to sign back in. All right, so as I was saying, if you're logged in, you'll have your name at the top. You can add a colleague here. And here you can type in anybody who already has a monitoring resources account. Um, I can start typing in PNAMP and add PNAMP user, or PNAMP contact. And the other thing you should notice that there's two different types of colleagues. You can have a collaborator, and collaborators can work on draft material with you, or you could have a reviewer. And a reviewer just looks at can look at your entire draft content, but they can't work on it. So it's sometimes a good idea to add your COR as a, a reviewer, but maybe not as a collaborator, unless you would like them to work on content with you. 
So I'm going to go back to the home page, but just an easy way to have people help you out in monitoring resources. <laughs> so also when you're logged in, you'll notice that you'll have this menu tab called portfolio. And here you can look at all of the content you already own. So I can click on my protocols and I can see which content I already own in monitoring resources or that I'm the owner of. And I can see, okay, I have some draft content here. I should work on that. I have a couple finalized content here. This I might want to uh, version, things like that. So this is a really easy way to get to the content that you already own. Now, if you're starting from scratch or you're starting yeah, a new project, the best thing to do is to head to this document button. You could also go to create and find, but we'll just click on document here. And this will take us to the document homepage. And here I can create individual study plans, I can create individual protocols, I can create individual methods, or I can start um, creating my BPA workflow. And so as it says right here, uh, you can create all the documentation needed to fulfill your BPA, BPA contracting all in one spot. So I'm gonna click on this BPA workflow. This is really just an organizational tool. And I'm gonna give it a name and again, it doesn't really matter what I name this because it's only for me. Uh, no one else is really going to see what I name the workflow. This is just a way for me to organize all the content I want linked together. So I'm just going to call this training workflow. Click save. Oops, and I've already created this workflow, so I'm going to call this training workflow too. Click save. So now I have this BPA workflow. And essentially, there's three steps in the BPA workflow. Step one is the study plan. Step two is the protocol. And step three is the sample design. It's really, you're creating these three individual entities, but all in one space. Um, so I'm going to start off with this step one. And I'm going to give it a title. And uh, your titles should be specific, including focal species, location, organi organization name um, for the study plan. And if you ever need uh, help on you know, what you might need to name something, there's help text under a lot of these required fields. So always look for that. So I add a study plan title. I'm going to add a monitoring program. And here I'm going to click on, we'll just pick, you can type in a, a name here USGS Fisheries Research. And to save some time, just so that we can get through the whole process, I'm just going to write in background for my background. But like I said before, if you need some help on what the background should look like, just read this help text underneath each of these required fields, and it'll kind of give you an idea of what you need. So the next thing I need to do for a study plan is add study plan objectives. So you just click on that little plus sign that I clicked here, and you can add as many objectives as you need. Um, your objective should describe your overarching goals plan for the research or monitoring project. And um, it can be, it should be fairly specific for your study plan. Um, right now, I'm just going to to keep things moving along. I'm going to type an objective. Obviously, that's not a great objective, but um, just for our purposes today. The next thing in a study plan, and this used to be in the protocol section, um, are this are these additional information tabs. Um, these are not required fields, but they can be really helpful. So you have this quality control and reporting. You have this personnel and training, and you have schedule and budgeting. So you can fill in as much of these as you want. Um, but like I said, they aren't required, but they are uh, useful fields to add. And then another important aspect of the study plan is to add figures and forms and documents. So if you have supplemental information that uh, you're kind of working off of, 
this is a great place to just add it. Um, it could be, you know, an annual report or it could be a figure. It could be anything. It could be your data collection form. Um, those are always great to add to your study plans and your protocols just to help the next person who comes along follow the process. And then if we scroll up to the top here, uh, you'll see that the required fields are name, monitoring program, background, study plan objective, and protocol. Now, a lot of you will be starting from scratch, so you won't necessarily have a protocol to add. Um, but if you do have a protocol, the only protocols you can add to your study plan is a protocol that you are already the owner of or a protocol that has already been finalized by someone else. So you won't be able to add a draft protocol from someone who isn't your colleague. Um, and for today's purpose, I'm not going to add a program protocol because we are going to uh, we are going to create our own protocol. Um, but just so you know, there are you can add a protocol to your study plan that's already been created. And if that's the case, it'll save you a ton of time. So then I'm going to save study plan without adding a protocol. Oh, I need to give it a different name. Okay, so there we go. You there, so if you didn't notice, I was getting a warning at the top. I didn't bother to read it because I thought I was just not saving my study plan objective. I uh, already have a study plan called USGS Spawner Abundance on the White Salmon. So then I just had to change the name because you can't have two study plans of the same name. Um, so here we have uh, all the fields, most of the fields that are required except for a protocol because we haven't created a protocol yet. So I am going to then go to step two and create a protocol real quick. And similar to the study plan, I'm kind of going to cruise through creating a protocol. Um, but I'll show you all the fields that are required. So first thing to notice in your protocol is this visibility um, menu. So I can either have my protocol visible to just myself and my colleagues or to everybody. And this is in draft form. If I have it visible to everybody, everyone can see my draft protocol. Once it's finalized, whether I have this as owner and colleagues or everybody, everyone can see it. So keep that in mind. Uh, but if you don't want someone seeing your draft work, uh, just keep it as owner and colleagues. And then uh, similar to the study plan, I'm going to add a protocol title here. And uh, I'm going to call this Spawner Abundance Survey 2. So it, the protocol title oftentimes is very similar to your study plan title. It does not need to be as specific. You don't need to add your organization. You don't need to add a specific location. But it should give a good idea of uh, what your protocol covers. Um, the next, next piece here is supplemental information. So this is where you would add your annual report, or if this if this protocol has been published in a journal article, that might be something you want to add here, um, just so that you, people know there's more to this than what's on monitoring resources. Again, um, we're going to give the pro, uh, the protocol some sort of background or rationale. So why? Are we creating this protocol? Uh, would you use, uh, explain why you would use the particular collection of methods within the protocol to answer your questions? Um, and all of that information, again, is in this help text below uh, the rationale. So it, it's really helpful to read that stuff. Sometimes it gives good examples of what um, you should put in there. Uh, so really look for this help text. It'll help uh, your products get finalized quicker. Um, and again, uh, protocols have objectives. And it's a little bit redundant with the study plan. Um, you can copy and paste your study plan objectives. But ideally, the protocol objectives are um, maybe not 
as specific as your study plan. And here, we even have an example of what a good study plan objective is. Um, and or what a good protocol objective is. And a protocol objectives, we aim for them to, to meet the SMART criteria. So SMART is specific, measurable, achievable, results oriented, and time limited. So that's kind of what you should keep in mind when you're creating your objectives. So here is a good example. Uh, estimate spawner abundance and escapement of wild hatchery steelhead. Um, and I might just steal this for our purposes today and put it right in there. <clears throat> now there's the citation section. And it, once a, one more thing, you can add as many objectives as you need. Uh, there's no limit. There is a limit to the characters, so. Um, so this citation section, this is for if you cited something within your rationale, uh, like an in-text citation, you're using methods or you're using a design by someone else, you can, uh, you can uh, put their full publicized citation in this section. Um, just another way to uh, kind of solidify your protocol, um, fulfill all of its requirements. And then this is a, another section called citation down here, but this is the citation of this specific protocol. So again, if it has been published elsewhere, like in your annual report or in a uh, journal article, you can fill in that information. Many of you, this, is, this will be the first publication of your protocol and you can just click on first published here in monitoring resources and it fills in all of the information for you. And then once I get this protocol finalized, it'll add that publication year to the year that I actually finalize it. So if I finished it today, it'd be 2023. So we're gonna save this protocol. Always important to save these as you're moving along. Um, Monitoring resources used to kind of time out on things on occasion. It doesn't do that so much anymore, but um, it's smart to just keep saving your protocol. Uh, so that my protocol isn't done yet. I still need to add metrics and indicators. I need to add methods to my protocol and I need to map my metrics and indicators to my methods. So uh, I'm gonna go through this real quick. Um, I will say protocols are the most time intensive piece of monitoring resources. So uh, keep that in mind. Um, so first thing I'm gonna do, I'm gonna click on this metrics and indicators section. Uh, it's very, this is a very important step, metrics and adding metrics and indicators because it will help me uh, find suitable methods for this protocol, and it'll help me find related projects uh, once my protocol is complete. So first, I'm gonna click on this add metric and indicator. I get this little pop-up here, and we have these little radio dial buttons. I'm gonna create a metric. If I wanna create an indicator, I just click on that. I can give it any name I want. I'm gonna call this one fish. Measurement. I'll give it fork length. And this, these, uh, these titles are really for your purposes. You don't, you, they should be pretty specific, um, but it's really for your organization or organizational uh, purposes. And a lot of times you'll use the exact same title that you have in your field manual. Uh, it's like, okay, I'm doing a collection of fork, or you know, I'm doing measurements of fork length. In my field manual, it says fish measurement dash fork length. I'll put that exact same thing in. So then the important part is actually categorizing your metric. So I am going to select fish here. And then subcategory, I believe, is length fish species. 
And then this particular method has a focus option. Some will have two focus options. And I'm just going to pick the focus option of a, a adult to juvenile range and click Save. So now we have this metric added to my protocol, which is great. Now I'm going to head to Methods. And I'm going to add previously finalized methods to my protocol. So by doing that, I can click on Add Methods. I get another pop up here. And because I've already created this fish measurement fork length metric, I have methods that are suggested to me. So that's why it's so important to do your metrics and indicators before you actually add methods, because now I can find a method that's already uh, finalized that uses the same metric or the same categorization. So I'm going to go to measure fish length, fork length right here. I just click on that little check mark and I click save. The other benefit of that, and I'll show you once we get to metric method mapping, is that my metric is automatically mapped to this method because I use the suggested methods uh, option. So I'll show you, you know, if you go the other route, you can add methods searching the entire method library. So I can search for a method here, and I'm going to type in electrofishing and click search. You also notice that the method I've already added is already in there. So when I search for electrofishing, I already have 73 matches, which is quite a few. And these are just finalized methods in monitoring resources. I can narrow this down a little bit more um, by choosing a program uh, to uh, that uses this particular elect or you know if I'm looking for BPA's AEM programs electrofishing method I can use that so I'm going to narrow this down now I only have 15 matches a little more reasonable when I click on them I get some information about that method so I don't by clicking on it it doesn't add it automatically which is great because now I can see OK, yeah, this looks like the exact same thing that I do. I'm just going to click on the arrow. And then I'm going to hit Save. So now I have these two methods added to my protocol. I can always delete methods uh, from here. And if I need to, I can also, if I can't find any suggested methods or finalized methods in the library, I can create a new method. So I can create a new method. It's going to open that method here. I give it a title. I say, yeah, it's a data collection method save and return to your protocol and now i have a draft method in my protocol the problem with a draft method in your protocol is you will need to finalize this method before you can finalize your protocol but this is a great way for organizing methods you need to add to your protocol so there might not be a method that you use that's available already on monitoring resources and you may need to create a new method. And it's really easy to do that within the protocol. And I can just click on this create method or this method's name title, and it'll open another window and I can do all the requirements for creating a method. I'm not going to get into that today. There are videos on monitoringresources.org in this learn section about uh, creating a method. Um, but 
today I'm not going to get into that. Uh, we can we can go over it another time, or if we have time at the end, I can show you. For now, I'm going to delete this method just because I'm not going to be able to publish this protocol without or with a draft method in there. So I deleted that method. One other thing to keep in mind here is I have these two methods here. Now let's say that this fish length, fork length method is really close to what I do, but it's not perfect. I can click on this pencil and paper icon next to the method. Oops, just kidding, not that one, because that's my own method. I can click on this pencil and paper icon next to the backpack electrofishing method. And I can customize this method to better fit my procedure. So all I do is I can explain why my purpose is different than this method's purpose. Or I can explain why my stepwise procedure differs slightly from this stepwise procedure. Um, so it's a really easy way to use someone else's method, but also make it your own specifically for this protocol. Um, and the reason I couldn't customize this method is because I've actually created this method and you can't customize a method you've created. What I could do is I could create a new version of this method, um, but that's a totally different thing. So you can only customize someone else's method, someone else's finalized method. So then the last piece of creating a protocol is this metric method mapping section. Click on that. And as I mentioned before, this fish measurement fork length metric is already mapped to the fork length method here, which is great. You'll notice at the top here that my backpack electrofishing method is not mapped to any of my metrics because I added this method via the searching the entire method library. So, what I'll do here is I can just add this method to this metric. So I click on add method here. And there it is, unmapped backpack electrofishing single pass method um, is right here. I can just check mark that and click save. I can also add other methods that I forgot to add in this method section by going to suggested methods based on this metric or searching the entire method library. Or I can also create a new method based on that metric. So there's a lot of ways you can add methods to your protocol. You don't just have to do it here. You can add methods here. You can, you know, add methods basically through this metric and indicator section as well. Um, so now I've fulfilled all the requirements. I have my title, I have a rationale, I have objectives, metrics and indicators, methods, metrics and methods mapped together. I can, uh, this automatically saves, which is really nice. If I wanted to finalize my protocol, Sorry, yeah, if I if I need to finalize the protocol, this was grayed out before, um, but now that I've fulfilled all of these requirements, I can request finalization. Um, I'm not gonna do that at this moment, but um, that's how you would do it. And you can final you can request finalizing elsewhere as well. So the last thing, uh, that the BPA workflow covers is the step three, uh, adding your sample designs. Uh, I don't have any sample designs already. Uh, I'll need to create a new sample design, and this will be the case for every BPA workflow. You'll create new sample design, and here there are multiple sample design options you can choose from. There's a census, there's an inference design, Something to note on the inference design, this is only if you have a 162 and not a 157. Inference design only documents your area of inference. It does not document your sampling uh, locations. And you can read all about that through here. You can click on these blue underlined highlighted sections too, 
and you'll get a little pop-up of the definition, um, which is really helpful. I'm going to choose this opportunistic design for my uh, sample design. And I this is not set in stone either. So I can choose this here, click Next. And it creates this sample design workflow. And you'll see here, I can change. I had chosen opportunistic. I can change to you know model based full, model based restricted. I can change to census. The only one I can't change to is that inference design. Um, I'm going to keep. I'm going to stay within opportunistic. I'm going to choose historic precedent. So this would be like I sample next to the Bonneville Dam, um, and we've been doing that you know for the last you know, 100 years, 80 years, I don't know. But yeah, so you can pick whatever spatial design category you want. First thing I skipped over, need to give the sample design a title. Um, we'll call this Bonner Abundance uh, White Salmon Survey 2. You know, give it. Again, you read the help text. It will kind of help you determine how much information you, you should be giving in the titles or in other fields. Notice here that this sample design is already linked to my study plan that I created earlier. So it's linked to this USGS spawner abundance on the white salmon, um, which is great. Another required field here, I need to add data repositories. I can click in here, I can search for them, or I can type in a name of one that I know should be on the list. Click on StreamNet Data Store. I can add multiple if I want to. You can, a lot of people have more than one data repository. So I can also type in, oops, the tag is. So now I got two data repositories linked to this sample design. And then uh, unlike your protocol and study plan, the description or the background or the rationale is not required for the sample design. But again, it is really helpful. You can give uh, some information on your spatial design or your temporal design here. It's not required, but it's useful. And you'll notice here, I can add images to it. I can add the map if I want to of where, you know, things, an area of where I might be sampling. I can add a table. There's a lot of usability, uh, yeah, usability out of um, our uh, toolbar. I'm just going to hit create, though. The sample design sometimes takes a second or two to create, but you'll see now I have this data repository created and the title created. And next, I can select my sites, or I can add documents, figures, and forms down here. But let's uh, select sites, keep this moving along. <clears throat> so first thing to know in selecting your sites, you can add other people's sites if you want to, to your sample design. Maybe you sample at the exact same place your colleague samples, and they've already documented their sites in monitoring resources. You can search for those sites by the site name, or you can you click on this advanced search, use some of this search functionality to find sites. I'll say most people do not use other people's sites, which is fine. Um, so you'll need to add your own sites, and I'll show you how to do that. So here's just you know map of the region. You can create new site. You can click on this, create new site, and you can just enter in the name of the site, the latitude and longitude, and hit create. And this can be really useful if you don't have too many sites to add. Um, also, what you can do is drop a point on the map. So I can click on this latitude or longitude button, click on this latitude button, and then zoom in to a spot on the map. Click again, see I, you know, sample there. It fills in the latitude and longitude of that spot, and all I have to do 
is create a new site name. So really simple, if you just have like five or six sites, that might be the best route to take. But most of you will have more than that. You'll have, you know, dozens to 100, maybe even more. And so I suggest obviously not typing in each individual site. Instead, you can upload a CSV of your sites. And so there are some requirements when you're importing your CSV. And you can see what those requirements are if you hover over this question mark uh, circle. But the first column needs to be name. The second column needs to be latitude. The third column needs to be longitude. And um, that's essentially it. You can have more columns, but you do need those first three columns to be specifically name, latitude, longitude spelled correctly. Uh, one other thing to keep in mind is the CSV files must use projection WGS84. It needs to be in the same format, latitude, longitude, as the WGS84. And then if you need help, you can also just download this template. And it gives you a template with an example of like site one. It gives you a latitude and longitude. And then it just has those three columns. And you fill in the rest of your sites within that. So then let's say you have a CSV file. All you need to do is you go to choose file. And you will pick your CSV file that you want to document. Highlight it, click open. And now I have all my sites uploaded, imported into this map. And you can kind of zoom in if you need to to get make sure that they're in the right spots. Um, you know, if they if you have a study that's on, you know, a river or a creek and you see a whole bunch of spots, you know, on plateaus and whatnot, you might need to adjust, you know, your uh, your settings for your latitude and latitude and longitude. So now I have all these sites. You can look at the list of sites here. There's 78 sites. They all have a site name, and they have a latitude and longitude. This is great. Uh, if I don't like these, I can bulk delete them. I can delete them individually, or I can edit each one if you know a site name changed or something like that. And then just click save. Always remember to keep saving. And this is where monitoring resources sometimes needs a little bit of time. It'll take some time to save these sites um, just because you know it's this map based that it's a little bit extra. But you'll get this, you know, these spinning squares. And uh, it is a lot faster than it used to be. Um, but the more sites you add, the longer it's going to take. But yeah, there you go. My sites are saved. They're still there. They look good. Everything looks good. I can, the one thing after I save the sites, I can no longer edit them, but you can still delete them. Um, so keep that in mind. Now, the next step, and this is the step that most people with BPA contracts will skip because it hasn't been super obvious uh in the old the old way to document your sample design is to add this area of inference so i'm going to click on area of inference here and here i get a map of my sites you're going to want to zoom in on your sites by clicking this little plus button and then what you do is you just click on one of your sites. And it usually takes two clicks. I'll probably just get one. This is great. Um, so you click on your site. And now all you need to do to add your area of inference is click on one of the blue words, uh, blue options. So if, I, if my area of inference is uh, you know, the huck for Upper Grand Ronde, I can just click on Upper Grand Ronde. And if you notice below the map now, there my area of inference has been added. You can add multiple area of inferences. 
So say I also have an, a different error of inference for these sites. I can click on that and I can say, you know, Upper Catherine Creek watershed. And that's been added there. And then you can add notes to your area of inference. Um, anything you, you feel is necessary for the next person coming along, uh, just add a few notes here. Um, anything you want and then click save. So pretty simple, but it's just easy to, to gloss over the area of inference section. And the problem is once you finalize your sample design, it's difficult to then go back and document your area of inference. Next thing we'll do is you got to plan your schedule. So the sample design is documenting your locations and documenting when you're actually going to do your data collection or data analysis. So click on plan schedule. You'll get a table of all of your sites and their titles. And if your sample design is simple, you just, uh, you go to every single site every year. Um, you can just add a start year and an end year. It'll pre-populate for one year if, you know, I added an extra year to my study. And then you just hit save. So this would indicate that I go to every single one of my sites every year. Now, some of you are going to have a panel design. And if that's the case, you can just click on, I have a routine panel design. You can indicate how many panels you have. And then you can rename them. So we'll call this one annual. We'll call this one odd. Call this one even. And then you'll select the years that you do your annual samples. So that obviously would be all the years. And then you select which sites you sample annually. And so it's easy to you know, click on a site, then hold the control button so you can add multiple sites. And then hit the arrow button. Now all those sites are assigned to the annual uh, sampling. Then you go to odd, you choose which years you're going to do odd sampling. And then, you know, again, you add all the sites, you do odd sampling, hit next. And then even, same thing. And you're going to need to select every single site um, through, you know, each site has to be in one of the panels. Uh, I'm not going to do it now because I have 78 sites, and so it'd just be time consuming. But what you would do is, you know, I would add, or I could, you know, add the rest of these to my even. I'd click save, and instead of having every site sampled every year, you know, we'd have those five sites that were sampled annually. We'd have five sites sampled uh, in the odd years, and all the rest of the sites sampled in the even years. For you know, simplicity purposes, I'm just gonna choose that I sample all my sites every year. Um, but if you want more tutorial on the pan panel design, uh, I'm happy to help anyone. Just going to click save. All right, so now I've saved this. It looks good. I got the check mark. I go to finalize here. And finalize is really more of a review page, um, but also you can finalize your sample design. But this is where you want to just make sure that everything looks right. All right, those are still all of my sites. Great. Um, it looks like I sample all of my sites every year. So this is where you can see when you're actually sampling each site. So it looked different if there was a panel design. But uh, yeah, every site every year. I have my area of inference here. I don't have any AOI notes, which is fine. And I can just hit finalize. And it'll 
ask you if you're sure you want to finalize, uh, just say yes, I'm, I'm sure. And it's finalizing my sample design. Great. So now we can go through my BPA workflow. Step one, 100% complete. Step two, 100% complete. One thing about step two, though, I haven't finalized my protocol, but all the fields are fulfilled. Um, step three, 100% complete. The one, another thing to, to keep in mind, you can add more than one sample design, and a lot of projects do have more than one sample design. So if I need to add another sample design, I just click on step three, sample designs again. And it'll take me, so here's the one I created already, but I can create a new sample design also, which is great. The last thing I wanna show you with the BPA workflow is, I don't know if you guys have noticed, but in all of these fields, in the upper right-hand corner, we have the study plan summary. And I can click on the study plan summary anytime I want. And this will give me an entire overview of this workflow's study plan. Um, or like the entire workflow. So this is my USGS Spawner Abundance on White Salmon 2 study plan. We got the study plan up here, all the information I added to it. We have the protocol beneath that. Uh, and with the protocol, we have those methods that I added. We have the metric that I added. And then we have our sample design here uh, with a map where you can look at your sites more clearly. If you want to, you can click on these and it'll zoom in. And then we have the data collection events table and the area of inference. So this is what I indicated as my area of inferences. So there's two of them. If you can see a little more clearly, there are two different area of inferences. Um, one is essentially within the other, but that's, you know, it's fine. And then any other information. So anytime you want, if you just want to kind of see the progress of your BPA workflow, you can click on that study plan summary button in the top, and then you can return back to it just by clicking on the workflow study plan. And it takes me back to my BPA workflow, training workflow too. And I can kind of go through this all over again. So that is essentially the BPA workflow, which is great. Um, and as I mentioned at the beginning, these are, the workflow is really an organizational tool. So I have a study plan in here. I have an individual study plan in here. I have an individual protocol in here, and I have an individual sample design in here. And I can see those individual products within my portfolio. So if I wanna go look at my sample design, I'll click on my sample designs. And I believe this is the one I just created, Spawner Abundance White Salmon Survey 2. So I'm showing you guys this because there's one more thing I want to show you guys today in this training, and that is documenting your actual sampling locations. So in years past, you've created a, a sample design. Then you did all your field work and you forgot about your sample design. And, uh, you know, that was kind of the end of it. But uh, what may be happening in the near future is that you will need to validate what sample locations you actually visited each year. So we've made that really easy by after you create your sample design, you go out in the field, you do your data collection or whatever you're doing, and then you come back to your sample design, which you could find, like I said, in portfolio, my sample designs, click, uh, you know, find your sample design, make sure this is the right one, and click on validate data collection events. And as you can see, there's a hover over there if you don't know what validate data collection events is. Here you can record which sites were actually visited, when they were actually visited, and any other details. So now I have all this information regarding my sample design. It's 2023, so it says that I'm currently collecting one of the years of my sample design. 
and I have two years that are planned because I had set my sample design from 2023 to 2025. So now let's say I did my sampling and I'm returning to the tool. I select which year I want to validate. And there are two ways to validate your sample designs. One of them, let's just say this is the simplest thing to do. Let's say I went to every single one of my sampling locations, sample sites, and actually were able to do my data collection, which is pretty common. I can just select all here, and it just check marks every single one of my sampling events for 2023, indicating that, yes, I actually was able to you know, sample at all of my locations. Or let's say like, one or two of them I couldn't get to, I can just uncheck those. So that is, that's the simplest way to validate your sites. Then you would go and you would add, a, uh, add the date that you started your sampling uh, collection and click Save. The other option you can do is, once again, you can import a CSV file of the sampling locations that you actually visited in 2023. So I could go to choose file here and click on you know my validation sites and click upload. This is a useful way to uh, validate your sites if you maybe only visited half of the sites here and you don't want to uncheck or check you know half the boxes, or if you went to a whole bunch of sites or you went to any sites that you didn't plan for. So if you added three or four more sites to your uh, sampling collection uh, events, you would need to upload a CSV because you can't really, it's difficult to add extra sites to this list without uploading a new CSV. And it's way simpler to upload the, a new CSV if you have, uh, if you're if you're going that route, um, but again, you know there are some requirements for the imported CSV. It's uh, similar to importing a CSV for your sample design. The first column is name. The second column needs to be latitude. The third column needs to be longitude. And then one extra thing, you'll need a fourth column that is like the date of when uh, you did your sampling. Uh, so that's the one extra piece of information that's needed. And again, you can download a template CSV. So it has those four columns, and then you just fill in the gaps. I am just going to do this select all of validate um, just to show you what it looks like. And then I'll need to choose what day I actually started my sampling collection. So let's say I started it on August 1st. I click Save, and now it's validating my sites. So this is essentially saying I planned for these sites, and I actually went to these ones. And great. So now it shows that I've completed 2023, completed 2023. I still have 2024 and 2025 planned. And the other cool thing about this is once I've validated my data collection events, I can go to Monitoring Explorer, which is a part of Monitoring Resources. You can get there by clicking on Monitoring Explorer up here. Um, if you go to the home page, you could click on Discover, the Discover button. Um, so I'm going to click. I already have the tab open. But I'm going to go to the Monitoring Explorer map. I have this map. This is a map of all the data collection events that are documented in Monitoring Explorer. I zoom in a little bit. When you zoom in, you can kind of play around a bit, see that these are all sites. There's 1,405 sites in this area. Um, now we are working on making Monitoring Explorer a little more user friendly. Right now, it isn't the most intuitive tool, uh, but I'll show you how I can find my sites 
that I just created um, and that I just validated. So I can go to this filter button, it'll pop up. It says filters here. The plus button is all the way over here. It's confusing. Uh, don't worry about it. <laughs> we know that it's confusing. And then I can search for those data collection events that I just validated. Uh, so there are various ways I can search for it. I can select the program. So if you remember, I had assigned these to the USGS Fisheries Research Program. So I could do that and click Apply. And essentially, it would just show all of the data collection events that uses um, or whose organization or program, sorry, program is USGS Fisheries Research. I can also search all of the sites that were validated within a certain date range. I can uh, search for my sites via the protocol. So I just scroll through this, or I can type in, you know, what what protocol it was, and it was, I believe, the Spawner Abundance Survey Two protocol. Click on that, and I click Apply. So just various ways you can search for your protocols, but um, we aren't going to get into that quite yet. But as you can see, I looked for that protocol, and now I have 78 sites here. These should be the sites that I just imported. I can zoom in. I'm just zooming in with my little scroll bar. And yeah, it looks like all of my sites Zoom in a little bit more. There we go. Yeah, that's on the Grand Run River. This looks great. And if I need more detail, if I want to make sure these are actually the sites that I just validated, I can click on one of the data collection events. And there we can see, yeah, there's the site name, um, latitude, longitude, where it's located, the study plan. Um, and I can click on this and go back to that study plan summary that I showed you earlier. Uh, I can see the protocol that's associated with that data collection event. I can see the data repository. This is one thing we need to fix because as you as I showed earlier, um, there's two data repositories associated with this site. But uh, you know, that's one of our hopeful uh, development projects for the next year. And in general, making Monitoring Explorer a little more useful, but it's really cool because now I've validated my sites and they show up here. And that's kind of the final step within, you know, the BPA workflow. It's not a uh, particular, like, especially part of that workflow because, but it's easy to get to after you've returned to your sample designs. But I can always go back to my BPA workflow, click on this anytime I want to. You can kind of just, it's a great organizational tool. Look at my study plan summary. As I mentioned before, I still haven't finalized my protocol. So eventually I'll need to come back here and request finalization. Oh, OK. I know that was <laughs> a bit of a fire hose and it started off a little bit rocky. Um, but we have 15 minutes for questions. Actually, you know what? Um, there's a few more things I'll show you before we go to questions. One one last thing I'll show you. I had mentioned it before. Is uh, this learn section? So especially if you're a new user, this learn section can be really useful. Uh, you can find out a little bit more about monitoring resources. But then in this FAQ page, click on that. At the top of the FAQ page, along with questions and answers below, we have all these different guidance documents and training modules. And so you can quickly jump. We've already created a guidance document for the BPA workflow. And this is found in pnamp.org. But yeah, there's a link to it right here. Uh, it's essentially what I went through today is step by step on what you need to do to create a BPA or to document all your BPA contracting needs through the BPA workflow. Um, a little help, some helpful hints and whatnot. And then if you're just creating specific material, there's a spe 
specific module on creating a method, a specific module on creating protocol, and so on and so forth. Um, so FAQ, really good place to start if you haven't been to monitoring resources in a while or uh, have never been to monitoring resources. We also have this glossary. The glossary, I kind of hinted at earlier when I clicked on one of those blue underlined words, it provided a pop-up. The pop-up pulls directly from this glossary. So monitoring resources terminology may differ slightly from what you're used to, uh, like how we refer to a protocol compared to maybe what you refer to a protocol as. So if you're ever a little bit confused by some of the terminology, it should be in our glossary and you can kind of go there and check it out. Last thing I want to show you guys in the learn section are uh, we have created some training videos. <clears throat> the training videos are typically just five minute, less than five minute little training videos on bits and pieces of monitoring resources, like adding a colleague. I kind of, you know, ran through that early on in this presentation on how to add a colleague. But you can just go to this training video and see the process of adding a colleague, uh, collaborator, or reviewer. I didn't talk at all about cloning a protocol, um, but if you are interested in cloning someone else's finalized protocol, you can go to this training video. Again, like I mentioned, there is a method creation training video, a method customization training video. I showed you guys that briefly, how to map your methods and metrics together. So all the things I mostly went through are also found in this uh, learn section in the training video section. So, uh, and then of course you can always contact me and I do have a few more slides, but we can skip most of them and just go to the contact page at the end. And maybe I'm afraid to stop sharing, but uh, just because Teams has held out on me so far, uh, but maybe... Uh, hey, Sam, maybe we uh, this, Lauren, yeah. Lauren Osborne typed a question in the chat uh, when you're talking about sample locations. Uh, I'll just read it to you because I don't know if you have that part up. Uh, does this change for a sampling area where sampling locations change from year to year within a specific area? I mean, like polygon versus point location. And Lauren, if you need to unmute and clarify, that's totally fine. Yeah. Uh, so if sampling locations are changing year to year, there is that panel. Um, so that it's panel application. Sorry, go ahead. It's more of like when we're doing vegetation surveys and uh, we have our like restoration area and we're not, we don't have specific points that we start our veg surveys at. It's like a systematic random sampling design. Um, sure. So those, the general area of sampling is consistent year to year, but those lo locations may change by a few hundred meters, if that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, so that is essentially sort of like that panel design. One thing we don't, you can't create a grids design within monitoring resources. At a time, we did allow that, um, but it, it, you know, uh, it changed so frequently, it was too hard to keep up in monitoring resources with creating your own grids design. Um, but you can indicate that you use a grids design in monitoring resources, but you use an external source like R to actually identify which sites you're going to each year. Um, and, you know, the way that you document that in monitoring resources is you can kind of approximate with, we don't do polygons, unfortunately, but we have that area of inference, which would be important for your, your study. Um, but you could kind of document, you know, approximate locations. But this is kind of a conversation you'd have with your COR. Um, and uh, and how they would want you to document it. Um, it. Whatever works best for you and your COR uh, is, you know, I'm not going to have a problem with. 
um, how you're documenting, you know, we are 100 meters off. It could just be you do some sort of sample design and monitoring resources. And there, on that validation page I didn't show you guys, there is a section where you can type in um, notes, essentially. And you can just type in and when you're validating your sites, like some of these sites shifted because, you know, it's in this general area, but we use a grits design and uh, so on and so forth. So it's not perfect, um, but uh, there are ways to kind of explain your sampling design, even if the exact locations might change yearly. Um, yeah, and that's just by, you know, having an external R source. Uh, other questions? Uh, do I see something in the chat? Yeah, Luciano, can you see it? Just a second. Okay, this interface repository seems to be a really good product. Folks working in the project I manage have Contributed a lot of protocols to admire, but we don't really use it ourselves much. Do you have a good sense of who are the main end users of these study plans and protocols? Um, are you able to track web traffic or downloads? Um, tracking web traffic and downloads? Not really. I'm sure there, we can approximately see uh which protocols are being reused um we can see which methods are being used by multiple people um we have shared some of this information with uh some folks in canada that are might be creating like a graph uh database that will help kind of track some of like what methods what protocols what areas are being most uh trafficked um but as far as the first bit of your question, uh, the who are the main end users? Right now, it's definitely you know BPA. Your COR is checking to see whether your protocols match what you say you're doing, and whether your sampling locations match approximately where you said you were going to go and when you're going to go. Um, and then any other potential collaborators along the line. We're trying to make more connections. If you remember uh, on one of the earlier slides with StreamNet, that indicates, uh, you know, if you have a data repository and StreamNet or uh, Pacific States Marine Fisheries Commission, we're trying to show, you know, that that data is housed in StreamNet, the metadata is housed in monitoring resources, and some of the contracting needs is housed in CB Fish. And so we can kind of get an idea of some end users that way. Um, Jen, I saw you turn your camera on. If you want to add to this. Oh, yeah, I will add. Um, clearly, if you're funded by Bonneville, then Bonneville is a, a key end user for the metadata associated with that those funded projects. Um, we're also in that same universe of Bonneville and the Fish and Wildlife Program. Um, when the council does reviews, we encourage the ISRP to look at the content and monitoring resources so that you all don't need to reproduce that information to describe your work to the ISRP or ISAB. We've, we've had um, both of those panels ask us for input. We've asked them for input, like how could we make the tool more effective for their review? Uh, we have had uh, researchers from sort of like outside our immediate universe. There's a fellow from Oregon State University, for example, who was looking for time series of uh, fish abundance estimates. And we were able to show, you know, documentation for current work, at least. He wanted to look back, you know, 50 years, but we could we could show currently this is how, um, you know, recent activities have been documented. And then, as Sam mentioned, the, the StreamNet repositories in particular, the, the CAP high-level indicators and the StreamNet data store, um, we're working to, to make better connections between this metadata and MR and the StreamNet tools. Because again, as a lot of funded work from Bonneville, um, on the fish side at least, is 
required to publish data over there, we're trying to um, make those connections easier and more transparent. And wish we had thought of that when we started a dozen years ago or whatever, but, um, you know, we're trying to remedy that now. So we've also seen, um, we have a new user from California that's using monitoring resources in their own data report repository to, to be a, a simple way to publish and and associate methods with their data, um, their own data repository. So there's there's growing use. We see uh, manuscripts like peer review journal articles, um, but be, you know you can cite the content in MR. It is a persistent URL. It's not going to go away. It's not a digital object identifier in that sense. It's not a DOI, but it is persistent. So we have seen journals accept that as a citation for content in a journal article. Again, trying to save people time for reproducing this stuff over and over, um, and also hopefully uh, trying to achieve a little consistency across projects so data could be more interoperable. Yeah. Thanks, Drew. Great question, Luciano. Um, anybody else, feel free to type in the chat or unmute and ask a question to Sam. Um, we're always around, so you can email us, and Sam can set up a meeting if you just want to talk. You can set up yeah. a Teams meeting if you want to screen share. Go ahead. Sam. Yeah, Meg, if you want to go back one slide. Jen's got it. Oh, Jen. So, yeah, sort of the next steps here. and. Uh, is uh, you can you can rest request one to one guidance. That's basically, you know, say hey, we're we're putting together our protocol, we're putting together our workflow. Um, do you have time to to meet with us? And I'll do a little pre work beforehand, review your project, kind of identify what might need to be created. And then we'll kind of go through it together. It's not going to happen all in one sitting. I'll kind of give you guys tips and advice to get going and what you need to do. Um, but yeah, it's it's pretty pretty simple. Um, or I mean, I don't know if it's simple, but it, it's a it's a user friendly workflow now that kind of tells you exactly what you need, which is much more helpful than it was before when you're kind of doing four different things and then at the end combining them together. Um, and yeah, as, as Meg said, feel free to reach out to me just with small questions also if you need any help. Um, and we do produce a monthly PNAP newsletter. Um, and there's sometimes some helpful tips within the newsletter about monitoring resources, new tools. Whenever we produce a new tool, we highlight that in, in the monthly newsletter. Um, so if you aren't, uh, part of the PNAMP newsletter, uh, you can reach out to us and we can add you or. You could drop your name in the chat right now. Yeah, drop we'll your name in the you. chat might be we don't We don't spam you with lots of emails. We pretty much send out one one a month, maybe two. If there's an event coming up, we might send a reminder. But yeah. And we never sell anything. <laughs> We're not going to share it with anybody else uh, if you want. And and we're tentatively planning another training session like this one in a couple months. Yeah. So um, keep that in mind if you're if you or if you know someone else. But if you can't wait, uh, Sam can help you. And Absolutely. we are planning to update the Explorer tool a little bit. We know it's clunky. Um, and we just haven't had the pennies to apply to it, but it looks like we'll be able to do some of that in the coming months to, to make it more user friendly. And we hope that as you all add actual sites in there, um, what Sam, we kind of just didn't have enough time, but what is very cool is you could see those 78 sites Sam put in there. You could also see sites from colleagues who have sampled in the same vicinity, for example, you may want to go ask them for data. You may want to plan next year to work together. You may, you know, so you could potentially have more data for your own analysis. You could be looking, maybe you're new to this universe and you just want to know who's doing what in the John Day Basin. Um, we, of course, do not have everything, but the more of you all that, that do this process of validating your actual sites, uh, the more interesting and useful the Explorer tool can be. 
And Sam, I don't know if you mentioned that we're recording this too and can make that available to help people yeah, if you're we'll working record through this. this. We'll cut out all the parts where I disappear for five or 10 <laughs> minutes. Uh, <laughs> sorry yeah. about that. Uh, you know, there has to be some technical difficulties if I'm you know, doing this for the first time of the year. But Yeah, we'll get it up on YouTube and we'll put that link out in the newsletter. Yeah, yeah. and you can share it with whoever you want. It'll also be up on monitoring resources in that learn training videos section. Um, so yeah, keep an eye out for it, but we'll, we'll let you know. Great, um, if there are no other questions, uh, it is 11.30. Um, and thank you all for joining. And yeah, feel free if you want to show the contact information slide one more time. Yeah, feel free to reach out to us at that top email address, gs-monitoringresources at usgs.gov um, if you have any questions. <laughs>